<laughs> Wonderful to see everybody. Welcome. Um, good afternoon. Um, I am Sarah Harding. I am the new dean here. I've been here all about four and a half weeks. So um, I'm still glowing with the joy of being here. Um, and that's what we all just to say about that. Um, so, um, I want to begin by acknowledging uh, Dalhousie is located on Mi'kma'ki, uh, the ancestral and unceded territory of Mi'kmaq. We are all treaty people. I also want to recognize that African Nova Scotians are a distinct people whose histories, legacies, and contributions have enriched that part of Mi'kma'ki, known as Nova Scotia, for over 400 years. So it's my pleasure um, to, uh, to welcome all of you um, and to, in to introduce this uh, 12th uh, in his Christie Lecture in Labor and Employment Law. I know Professor Vicky Russell will be introducing our speaker, uh, Professor Adele Blackett, but I do want to extend a very, very warm welcome uh, to her. I'm looking forward to hearing her lecture on Beyond the Boundary of Systemic Black Racism in the Workplace in Canada. My job here is to say a few words about Professor Innes Christie. So Professor Christie was born here in Nova Scotia. He started his academic career at Queen's in 1964. In his time there, he completed his book, The Liability of Strikers and the Law of Torts, a comparative study of the law in England and Canada. In 1971, he returned to Nova Scotia and took up a post here at Dalhousie Law School, where he taught full-time until 2003 and then part-time until 2007. He served as our dean from 1985 to 1991. He was my dean uh, when I was here. Um, so Professor Christie's teaching interests were wide. Labor and employment law, poverty law, municipal law, administrative law, contracts, commercial law, and professional ethics. He had a leading role in law, law reform. He was engaged in the Woods Task Force on Labor Relations in Canada in 1967. He drafted the Nova Scotia Trade Union Act in 1973 with former Dean Reed and the Nova Scotia Labor Standards Code in 1972. He also changed the way employment law is taught in law schools, in part through his influential book, Employment Law in Canada. Professor Christie served in the 1970s as a member of the Canadian Anti-Inflation Appeal Tribunal, was counsel to the Nova Scotia Labor Standards Tribunal, and was chair of the Nova Scotia Labor Relations Board. In addition, he was deputy minister, in the Nova Scotia Department of Labor and served as a member and chair of the Nova Scotia Workers' Compensation Board. He also served as a part-time member of the Federal Public Service Staff Relations Board and of the Canadian Human Rights Commission Tribunal. Professor Christie's career was of the sort that perhaps we all aspire to. He taught, he mentored, and he inspired generations of labor law students across Canada. His contributions to academic labor law, to public policy formation and administration, to labor arbitration and adjudication, and to legal education are broad, deep, and enduring. I mentioned a few moments ago that he was dean during my time here as a law student. It's worth noting that was a rather difficult time. It coincided with the 1985 Weldon Fire and four years of building renovation and construction. Despite these challenges, I remember him as a strong, effective, optimistic, and compassionate leader. He was, in short, a really, truly remarkable role model. The Innes Christie Lecture in Labor and Employment Law honors his life and his work. I would like to thank Professor Liam McHugh Russell for making this lecture happen and for the absolutely indispensable assistance provided by Elizabeth Sanford. So, Professor McHugh Russell. 
Professor Mikhail Russell will now introduce Um, if I might, I'd just like to, um, to recognize uh, Sean Christie, who um, has continually supported um, the Christie Lecture and Symposium series um, and has been very supportive, supportive of, of the work that I've tried to do um, to uh, bring his legacy uh, to the, the Halifax, the Nova Scotia, and the Canadian community um, since I started here in the middle of the pandemic. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, to Jean and your family you. for, for your support. Um, and thank you to, to, Dean, for, to, to Dean Hartman for uh, your introductions um, uh, of Christie and uh, Innocent Christie and his legacy. Um, um, it's my distinct pleasure uh, to uh, introduce Adele Blackett, Professor of Law at McGill University. Canada Research Chair in Transnational Labor Law, and this year's Innes Christie Distinguished Visiting Professor in Labor and Employment Law. Um, I have some long formal remarks that it's important for me to put on the table regarding her uh, accomplishments and plots that she's received. But I, I did want to give a moment informally uh, because of the uh, length uh, of uh, our relationship Professor Blackett was my master's supervisor and my postdoctoral supervisor, and I was resistant to putting myself at the beginning of um, these remarks. Uh, but um, as I as I thought to myself, and, and excuse the dad joke, um, it's my party and all crow. <laughs> <laughs> See, it doesn't work. Right? It just it makes it funny. We're not funny. Um, but I'll, I'll say a bit more about about yeah, how important that relationship has been um, in a moment. But uh, let me point to just some of the reasons that I did ask Professor Black to come and serve um, uh, as the visiting professor in labor and employment law. As Canada Research Chair, as Trudeau Scholar, and as uh, and a recipient of multiple other research awards, Professor Black has done groundbreaking research within and beyond the boundaries of labor law nationally and internationally. Um, her contributions to scholarship, trying to understand the linkages between global trade um, and matters of working conditions, um, in her contributions to that scholarship, she helped us as scholars and as lawyers appreciate how that relationship turns in part on colonialism and its legacies and on the structural divide between the global north and the global south. She was a pioneer in scholarship that has begun to think through the continuing relevance of historical African slavery on present day working relationships and patterns of work. Uh, in part through her research handbook um, on the topic, she conceived and assembled with her co-editor, Andrew Bilko. Uh, she has made indispensable contributions to the growing field of transnational labor law. And what does that mean? Well, she has, uh, in through that work, shed light on how labor norms, domestic, regional, and international, help shape working conditions across borders, not only through the actions of domestic courts and international processes, but also through corporate codes of conducts, global protest movements, and everyday law, uh, including inside the household. And on that note, in her 2019 book, Everyday Transgressions, which was uh, an award winner in 2020, um, that book was not only a chronicle of her work alongside domestic workers and domestic worker activists to make domestic work visible, valued, and recognized as work uh, that is worthy of protection, but it was also a case study in what international labor law can and should do. She's an innovative teacher. Uh, my favorite moment in uh, her history of, of teaching was a course that I actually participated in. Um, it, it was called Transnational Futures of International Labor Law. It integrated her teaching into a series of 12 panels and lectures featuring close to 50 global experts in labor law, working conditions, international labor standards, and human rights. And if you go on the McGill University website, you can still find uh, YouTube videos of all 12 of those uh, lectures from, from 2019. Um, but beyond her research and her teaching, very much in line with the Weldon tradition of unselfish public service that we celebrate here uh, at Dalhousie University and the Schulich School of Law, and in ways that very much parallel 
Professor Christie's own career, Professor Blackett has continually successfully translated her forms of expertise directly into projects with real world impact. She serves, for example, as one of uh, 10 part-time members overseeing the Commission des Droits de la Personne et des Droits de la Jeunesse, which is responsible for rights policy making and for litigating rights violations in the province of Quebec. She was the lead expert in the international labor organization's <laughs> processes that led to the promulgation in 2011 of the Domestic Workers Convention, and she is currently serving as chair of the federal government's task force reviewing the Canada Employment Equity Act. The scale and scope and impact of her work and her stature as an expert have earned, earned her numerous accolades. She's recipient of the Queen Elizabeth II Diamond Jubilee Medal, the Christine Tuckney Award of Merit from the Belfort du Québec, and a Pathfinder Award from the Canadian Association of Black Lawyers. And in 2020, she was elected a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada in the Academy of Social Sciences. Let me say, return to that per personal relationship. There's a perception, I think, uh, of academic stars that they succeed in part by leaving certain forms of care work to others. Faculty committee work, student mentorship, community leadership, that's for people who aren't stars. And if that is how we define academic stars, then I have to admit Adele is nothing of the sort. At McGill, she headed faculty recruitment for five years and helped convene the university's caucus of black faculty. And my direct experience of Professor Blackett is that she exercises uncharacteristic, that is, not common, patience, generosity, and thoughtfulness in her role as mentor and teacher, and I am personally grateful for the contribution she has made to my own legal career. And I know there is a host of other students who can say the same. And so given how much I have learned from her and the support that I received from her, I'm so glad we have the opportunity to learn from her today as she delivers the annual Christie Lecture and the keynote of our symposium, uh, Christie Symposium in Law and Labor and Equality on the topic of Beyond a Boundary of Systemic Anti-Black Racism in the Workplace in Canada. Um, after which we will have some time, <laughs> knock on wood, uh, for questions from the audience before a reception. Um, so please join me in giving a warm, well done welcome to Thank you. Thank you, Professor Matthew Russell. Thank you, dear Ian, for that far too generous uh, introduction. And uh, I can only begin to express how much it means to see someone who I've so admired uh, exercising uh, this role as professor, as convener, as uh, leader of the university. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dean Hardin for that introduction, for uh, characterizing uh, so effectively the incredibly inspiring contributions of Dean Innes Christie. And Elizabeth Sanford, I'm glad you're still here. <laughs> Your support has been absolutely outstanding, and I'm deeply grateful to you uh, for all that you've done to get me here. <laughs> it was not obvious for me to go. So, it's a tremendous honor to be back in Halifax and at Dalhousie University to deliver, deliver the lecture in honor of a true giant in Canadian labor and employment law, Innes Christie's contributions to teaching, mentoring, scholarship, public policy are quite simply inspiring. And regrettably for me, I did not have the opportunity to get to know Innes Christie personally. So when Professor McHugh Russell issued the generous invitation to me, uh, to come and speak about the Federal Employment Equity Act Review Test Force report mm -hmm. that has yet to be published. <laughs> uh, I thought perhaps Innes Christie's role in the Woods Commission uh, Task Force on Labor Relations would be my most immediate need, or maybe his past role at the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal, or maybe even the attention that he placed on the rights of unorganized workers and migrant workers early in his career and in his uh, path-breaking case book and put on Canada uh, would be uh, my focus. But then I happened upon an August 2000 report 
of the Employment Equity Guidelines Committee, on which he also served, alongside key members of the African Nova Scotian and Mi'kmaq communities, including Dalhousie's Professor Carol Elwood and the esteemed late Rocky Jones. The report begins powerfully by stressing the importance of learning from history. So let me share just a small part. The committee writes, history has clearly shown that ignoring the problems or pretending they do not exist has never served as a means of resolution. The historical patterns of exclusion and differential treatment serve as one of the most significant hurdles to capitalizing on the strength of our growing diversity. The answer to the problem is not to be found in catchy phrases and are wishful, uh, wishing for change. Private and public businesses and institutions must do more than simply state we support equal opportunity. The barriers will not be removed as a consequence of simple pronouncements or one-time cultural awareness programs. In Nova Scotia, we need to only look at our history to see that equal rights have never been provided voluntarily. Repeatedly, it has been shown that progress has only been achieved through enforced mechanisms. So this prescient affirmation could very much have been written today. And review of the report also reminded me that Innes Christie was dean also when the historic indigenous and black, black and Lima program was introduced here at Schuylkill School, fundamentally reshaping the face of the legal profession in Nova Scotia and in Canada to foster equitable inclusion. So alas, I won't be able to speak about my own task force report, you will have gathered that, uh, because it is not yet public, but uh, despite our excessive optimism, I will uh, take up uh, Dean Christie and the Employment Equity Guideline Committee's invitation to look closely at our history. So I want to start, therefore, by thanking uh, Dean Harding for the acknowledgement of the land and adding um, that I solemnly acknowledge the history of settler colonialism built on the so-called doctrine of discovery, out of which notions like terra nullius discovery, sovereignty emerged. As labor law scholars, there is much work to do to engage the challenge that truth and reconciliation presents for our field. Grappling with the history of our field is perhaps also a point of continuity between this talk and a previous talk that I had the distinct privilege uh, to give in 2019 around the time of the Isle of Centenary, then as now, I wish to underscore that when we look at our history, we can see just how transnational it has long been, and not only in the sense understood by Philip Jessup, all law that regulates actions or events that transcends national frontiers. The, the transnational includes a part of our history that as Canadians, we do not so readily allow ourselves to recall. But if we are to move beyond the boundary of anti-black racism, rooted in our own shared history of both slavery and racial segregation, we must. Yes, Canada has a history of slavery on our soil, was caught up in the trades of slavery as a global institution that enabled the emergence of industrialization, including distinctly Canadian industries like cod fisheries and sectors like banking. In this lecture, I will not focus on that, however. I will focus on one of the legacies of slavery, and that is the largely untold story of racial segregation in the world of work in Canada. We have come so effectively and rightly to focus on the effects of discrimination that we may have inadvertently walked past our history. Reclaiming this history is therefore the first part of my talk. The second part will reference the emergence of the duty of fair representation. And I'll seek to, to illustrate that the weight of the erasure 
of anti-black racism in this duty uh, is not a peculiarity of US law that failed to travel well when we imported the notion via the steel and Louisville and Nashville Railway to make a decision. But rather, it is foundation and presents us with choices in the form of inherent tension that we need to take very seriously. And so third, and finally, I'll posit that the paradox of the unresolved choice at the heart of the majoritarian frame of the Wagner Act model is something that we should refuse to individualize too quickly. Instead, I think that paradox steers us to a choice that we should take. That is the necessary justification for a proactive commitment to embracing societal transformation by achieving and sustaining substantive equality through employment okay. So I acknowledge that there are good reasons why some will walk past the so-called history board. I acknowledge that there are more conventional approaches that would, of course, focus on statistical underrepresentation. Our 2021 census data begin just to show the depth of underrepresentation in work from which black workers uh, in Canada uh, are at once overrepresented in work for which they are overqualified, underrepresented in work for which they are qualified. I believe we need to engage in this work, but we also need to get up with the weight of our past. Uh, and so our engagement in Canada with truth and reconciliation has been I believe an important part of recognizing the importance of dealing with history for its own sake. And let me point out again that the 2000 Employment Equity Guidelines Committee, in which Innes Christie took part, recalled uh, that it is not only difficult to talk about these issues, to talk about race, sometimes it's difficult to listen. And the committee encouraged our profession to learn, in particular, how to understand, and then to move from that understanding to action. So I begin, of course, in labor law each year with Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s deep understanding of the links between substantive equality and labor law. And so in a deliberate act of memory, I remind our class of why so much of what we talk about in the law is also the quality law. Um, and so I turn to the speech that he delivered the evening before he was assassinated, his very famous up into the mountaintop speech, which was in deep solidarity with Memphis striking sanitation workers. Those workers were striking for union recognition. And their claim could hardly have been more fundamental. It was literally, I am a man, encompassing so much of what, as labor lawyers, we understand to be at the core of the claim for recognition, voice, dignity. Dr. King reminded us in his earlier speech in Solidarity to the same workers that all labor has dignity. So it's in this spirit that I, that I truly serve. So, Professor Cecil Walker, uh, my apologies, Cecil Foster's Craft Baking 2019 book, They Call Me George, The Untold Story of the Black Training Porters and the Birth of Modern Canada, alongside complementary archival research, are central to the act of memory 
and I did miss part of my presentation. Animated by the question of why we do not know more about the struggle of black people who fought Jim Crow style laws and political policies here in Canada as an act of claiming, as an act of claiming full humanity and citizenship. Foster then posits that Canada became an officially multicultural state, and I quote, because of the pioneering work of the railway planters. If, uh, if they were men and in-home domestics, if they were workers, if they were women. Foster's beautiful book repeatedly underscores the porter's dignified refusal, centering the pride of the black workers and what, how they held it in their way of being, in their way of presenting themselves in the community institutions that they built, including historic black churches, in supporting community work, but also, and perhaps primarily, in claiming full citizenship through collective organizing. So I'm going to offer three examples of the kind of segregation in the railways in Canada that they faced. First, black men from Nova Scotia were specifically recruited as porters alongside black men from the southern United States, British colonies and the Caribbean, and of special interest to this crowd is uh, that the first and only black chief justice of the Federal Court of Appeal, the Honorable Julius Isaac, was one of them. We might have thought of that segregation as merely de facto occupational segregation that left them working such long hours, struggling to stay away, always at the service of passengers. Uh, the porters were the good housekeepers, but barely paid a living wage. However, it was formalized by law to start a 1926 memorandum of agreement emerged from a report of a board of conciliation and investigation at the time in the face of a dispute over colored dining employees, dining car employees in the brand truck lines. They were being replaced by Whitehall in the Canadian National Railways. And so the board unhesitatingly concluded that there was no race prejudice, then received the memorandum that it described as signed by representatives of the company and the employees. There's no mention of whether those employees included the black employees, but the executive of the Canadian Brotherhood of Railway Employees, which was formed in Moncton in 1908 uh, and was in bitter rivalry with the U.S. Brotherhoods, initially restricted members to whites. The memo, memorandum of agreement ensured that segregation would be enshrined and legally sanctioned. And for example, the segregation was part of the 1944-1945 agreement between CN and the Canadian Brotherhood of Railway Employees. The segregation continued well into the 1960s. Second, the segregation was reflected in labor law cases. It ranged uh, from 1920 when the Board of Conciliation heard a case involving the dismissal of seven porters for union activity in the order of sleeping car porters. And CPR won its case based on a clause unique to the porters that enshrined the at will doctrine uh, of employment. Uh, and it was justified on the basis, well, that the porters' work on the trains was akin to domestic work in the homes. They could be dismissed. It included cases that occurred even after the Fair Employment Practices Act was introduced in 1953. And of course, after the introduction of the 1935 U.S. Wagner Act model um, in Canada in 1944. And I underscore this point because the Wagner Act framework is often expressed as having moved workers past the unbridled freedom of contract with whomever one might choose 
that emerges from our Supreme Court of Canada's Christie and York decision. That, Mr. Christie, Fred, was a black Montrealer. He was refused service in Tabor on the basis of his race, and with the support of the black community, fought the case all the way to the Supreme Court of Canada. Through the decision rendered faithfully in December 1939, after World War II had just started, our Supreme Court entrenched racial segregation in Canadian law. And as the cases I can show, our ensuing labor law framework did not then operate the same movement for black workers that it did for other workers. So third is the speed with which in Canada we passed from specifically discriminatory provisions to the absence of any discrimination at all. The cases provide glimpses of the interaction of labor law frameworks and frameworks with racial neutrality and racial innocence, even in the midst of ongoing segregation. So a 1961 inquiry by the National Committee for Human Rights found that although the dining car employees were all white, except for one, and the sleeping car partners were non white, except for about 12%, this was not racial discrimination. The inability to promote sleeping car porters to the ranks of conductors was just a, quote, peculiarity of the structure. <laughs> Why? Well, because the employment conditions were governed by collective agreement, and that collective agreement contained no provisions that were racially discriminatory. So the committee did not deny the history of segregation. It didn't need to because there was no, there was legal magic in the 1953 Fair Employment Practices Act. It outlawed discrimination. Okay, so we know this to be the long precursor of an approach to equality uh, that only emerged with the advent of Section 15 of the Charter. So substantive rather than formal. But I wish to tease out three elements of the reasoning of the time that are all too familiar in the contemporary responses to attempts to redress discrimination proactively. First, pay attention to how the legal conclusion is framed in this same uh, commission inquiry. So the complaint is framed in regard to uh, the black porters who sought the access to uh, positions that allow them to be promoted as, quote, an attempt by one group of employees to obtain jobs belonging to another group of employees. <laughs> and it's not a valid charge of racial discrimination. The presentist claim is possession. Perhaps today, we might substitute a word like merit. Legitimacy claims justifying an order too often, too immediately stripped from their persistent historical context. Second, a slightly more nuanced report and inquiry was rendered a little while later that same year it recognized, okay, there's a legacy of the past in the form of the collective agreement, but it didn't go beyond acknowledging black sleeping car porters' feelings of discrimination. In the light of the broader context, though, it did recommend that the two groups be integrated. And it did something that we immediately recognize, of course, as our labor law constant, uh, mindful of the direction started via the Weber decision. Uh, it validated the use of normal grievance procedures as the best method to ensure fair administration of assignments and promotions under the collective agreement and in the event of unfairness, well, the griever should go and take the mechanisms to the Canada Fair Employment Practices Act of the investigators for complaint. Okay, so let's and third, let's not forget why this started uh, to look, what it started to look like on the ground by the time 
uh, we got to this more formal decision, uh, or more nuanced report, there were no non-white employees among the sleeping car porters, and there were very, very few non-black employees among those eligible for promotion. So the time dimension and the context dimension, the message was sent, not much needed to change. So the merger of seniority groups, it ultimately happened in 1964 after a further recommendation by the CLC, the Canada Labour Congress's Human Rights Committee, and a long negotiation, uh, as well as a referendum by the union. And one might have imagined that a proactive approach would be then what would follow um, in relation to the history of a lack of promotion. Uh, but, uh, of course, uh, features that would have hinted at employment equity, like establishing training programs and other opportunities for employees to take them, were left to the subject of their discussion and agreement. Okay, so in keeping then with the transnational theme, you won't be surprised that I turn to one of the United States' uh, Supreme Court decisions that has had a fundamental impact on how we deal with the issue of minority representation in Canada and reconcile cases of discrimination in representation, the Steele case that we mentioned at the outset. So it establishes a duty of fair representation and it is you know, actually a very short case. As uh, Professor Brian Langell, whose mentorship coached me uh, from Geneva back to Canada and into academia, has rightly argued recently in a lovely tribute to Justice Wilson Silverman Adela uh, that it is a case comparable to Roncarelli in its ability to frame fundamental rights through administrative law principles and this prior to Brown v. Board of Education and uh, prior, of course, to our charter. The Steele case operates a sophisticated balance 10 years before the U.S. Supreme Court's decision, and it reflects an early NAACP strategy, uh, quickly quelled, by the way, due to fears of McCarthyism to attack segregation through the World War. For many years, its ratio alone was assigned, uh, notably in our labor law Facebook group, uh, a textbook, uh, to students of Canadian labor and employment law. And I realized how much that abstract left aside when a brilliant uh, former student, now uh, another well-regarded uh, law professor in international law, uh, insisted that the case could not possibly have at its core the, fact, the core facts, the existence of a segregated trade union. That is the trade union that refused to admit black firefighters as members although it had been granted the role of exclusive bargaining agent for the craft mm -hmm. Yet the facts are eerily close to the history I've just framed for you uh, in the same sector in Canada. As Chief Justice Stone wrote in the 1944 decision, the Brotherhood purporting to act as a representative without informing the black firefighters basically decided uh, to amend the collective agreement, to exclude them. So that was all it took uh, for only white firefighters to be eligible to be promoted to the right for the years. Chief Justice Stone reasoned through the legislation of past jurisprudence uh, that, uh, quote, labor organization chosen to be the representative of the craft is thus chosen to represent all of its members, regardless of their union affiliations, or wanted them, yes, wanted them, because of course they were each Reasoning purposively, if abstracting away from the segregation that would persist and the distinct black choice that it entailed, Chief Justice Goldstone nonetheless underscored the fruit of the collective agreement, that is, the collective agreement supersedes the terms of the separate agreements of the employees and reflects the strength and bargaining power. So the benefits and advantages are meant to be open to all, and instead, the workers get uh, a duty of fair representation. So how can a labor union, which excludes this, 
um, minority from its craft have any standing to act as the representatives. That's how Mr. Justice Black would have dealt with this in his brief concurring decision. And Mr. Justice Murphy, also concurring, turned directly to the nature of the economic discrimination faced by the blacks at the hand of the Brotherhood and uh, spoke vehemently about the utter disregard for the dignity and well-being of uh, those citizens and called uh, for them to be beyond legal niceties, uh, beyond statutory interpretation, and address the economic cruelty. 1943. So in Steele, it was clear there was no administrative remedy that could be secured separately, uh, and uh, the response then lay in judicial cognizance. Part of the political economy of the Wagner Act is, of course, the unresolved tension that frames this relationship between the individual and the collective. And uh, certainly, law scholar, uh, labor law scholar Mark Barenberg argues uh, that this uh, uh, tension, uh, consent of the majority, uh, versus uh, the ability and the, and the attempt through Progressive thought at the time to, to support uh, social integration uh, through uh, at once uh, expression by the individual uh, in the form of engaging in collective action, but also group coherence and the ability to support that group coherence. But that tension remained unresolved uh, in the Wagner Act, and indeed, in the context of steel. Uh, I think we have to accept that this is not a matter of individual discipline, but representational conflicts that are made between a majority and a minority that, quite frankly, understands its interests differently. And please follow me in the movement away from the context where racial segregation is written into the law to the context in which the legacy of racial discrimination remains in workplace representation. So the minority is not infrequently an historically marginalized group, recently hired, often younger workers facing inferior working conditions at the heart of the Mohan decision, uh, that managed to keep the door slightly ajar uh, uh, for access to human right conditions and tribunals, uh, and uh, before the recent court's decision. Uh, I note, by the way, that although Horos may have seemed to slam the door shut, uh, several human rights tribunals outside of Manitoba Six Works have still been asserting their concurrent jurisdiction. So you can feel it. This lecture could go in at least three different directions now. First, it could follow Horos. Uh, and in particular, the strongest cries of alarm over the direction. Uh, for example, the Coalition of Black Trade Unionists of Canada last year reminded the labor community that human rights legislation is a significant part of the outcome of generations of anti-racist struggle in a long way to justice. They affirm that despite all of their work, as black trade unionists seeking to educate unions on the realities of anti-black racism for black workers pursuing arbitration rather than human rights tribunal remedies is often, and I'm quoting here, as difficult and as traumatizing as the initial experience of discrimination in the workplace. End of quote. So as we celebrate resolutions through labor institutions, are we really listening carefully to those historically marginalized minorities who fear that they are being left without the necessary, if admittedly, deeply imperfect alternatives? <coughs> or second, my talk could take the path followed by a number of jurisdictions comparatively calling for us to rethink our tendency to leave minorities without separate representation under collective bargaining law, preferring, despite the legendary challenge raised by Sir Alton Floyd, uh, to 
borrow other models. This is a challenge. I know that Sir Bob Heppel met not only in his reply to this confront, but also in his contributions to transforming post-apartheid labor law in South Africa, where a majoritarian representational frame is balanced with moderated rights for minority groups. This path elicits consternation in Canada and the US, and not without reason. It should not be taken lightly, precisely because the stakes are so high for all who are committed to the effective exercise of collective bargaining rights in Canada. But I do not choose not to pursue this path for that reason alone. The core claim, at its heart, is for historically marginalized workers to be meaningfully present in the workplace and able to build career trajectories to be meaningfully consulted. This, in other words, is at its essence a call for equitable inclusion in the workplace, which is in itself a call for workplace transformation. So there is, I would suggest, a third path. Maybe not so surprisingly a path less followed. And I would not quite, I have not quite personally reconciled whether this path is more feared than the first path or less feared than the second, so softly resisted. It's the path of taking the charge of achieving and sustaining substantive equality as integral to our understanding of labor law. In other words, it is the historically rooted case for taking employment equity's transformative potential very seriously. I'll offer uh, a counterintuitive starting point for this argument. In the McGill University Health Services uh, Health Center case, uh, not through Justice Deschamps majority decision framing the need for individualized assessments on accommodations, but rather through Justice Abella's heavily criticized concurring opinion that has always intrigued me for its attempt to support and incentivize unions and management to cooperate to enable the emergence of collectively arrived at agreements. It suggests that she's wanting to pay attention to barrier removal proactively as a way to achieve substantive equality, something that's fundamental to employment equity. And at the center of that concurring opinion seems to lie the question, how might labor law and substantive equality incentivize the development of collectively negotiated bargains? And part of that, I would suggest, is ensuring spaces for meaningful participation by those who are historically underrepresented in those processes. That MUHC opinion acts somewhat as the Janus-based version of the earlier jurisprudential high watermark, one that is widely regarded as encapsulating employment equities principles, the Mayoran decision, and Mayoran calls on us to question whether the standard itself, in that case, an aerobic test applied to an experienced female firefighter in a male-dominated profession, repeated historical continuities between these cases in their sector, presented as an ostensibly neutral uh, standard because its legitimacy was not held up to scrutiny, but how that standard itself may embed systemic discrimination. So rather than proceeding simply to leave the standard untouched and seek individual accommodations, may or may challenge as much of the malleability, indeed artificiality, of the distinction between direct and adverse effect discrimination and favor of a unified approach. And it captures, again, so much of the barrier removal approach. So employment equity, then, is inextricably linked to our understandings of Canadian jurisprudence. 
of substantive equality. It epitomizes in Fraser, as just as a dog refers to it, good Fraser. Uh, 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 and uh, for the purposes of this presentation, I'm actually duty bound to add that the decision uh, rendered barely one year later, Sharma does not overrule Fraser, but frankly, if its general direction is subsequently followed, uh, much of our jurisprudence on substantive equality will be uh, yeah, in danger. But Fraser is quintessentially a labor law, employment law, social security law, equality law case, substantive equality, Justice Developer claims, offers us a remedy for exclusion and a recipe for inclusion, and the case painstakingly consolidates the jurisprudence on adverse impact discrimination. And I want to stress that its purpose through the equality analysis uh, keeps us focused on protecting the groups. Um, tellingly, uh, the distance um, that our Supreme Court has deliberately taken uh, from U.S. jurisprudence, uh, uh, and wisely so, uh, is retained. But uh, Fraser uh, returns us to the 1971 Roots decision from the United States, another case about racial discrimination against black workers, uh, a case that was foundational to our understanding of employment equity um, and central to the 1984 report of the Royal Commission on Equality and Employment. Um, so the Griggs case, uh, basically the employer required employees to have a high school diploma to pass standardized tests, uh, and um, to take on a particular form of work. Okay, so the case doesn't deny the history of segregation of the company. African Americans worked only in one department. The highest paid job uh, was less than the lowest paid job in all the other departments and promotion <coughs> happened by seniority. So the Supreme Court recognized that the requirement of the high school and did I, um, uh, test uh, was introduced uh, after Title VII uh, was introduced and after segregationist policies uh, were removed uh, and that white employees hired prior to the policy change uh, didn't have to have high school diplomas and they continued in their jobs. So rather than requiring proof of intent, we know the Supreme Court of the United States uh, was able to emphasize the effects. So achieving equality of uh, employment opportunities by removing barriers. And it acknowledged that the tests, although neutral on their face, potentially even neutral in intent, cannot be maintained if they operate to freeze the status quo of prior discriminatory employment practices. In other words, present intent may not matter, but I'd submit history does. So the Griggs decision insists on seeing that history as part of understanding the status quo was being frozen. And in coming to that point, the Supreme Court acknowledged the history. It was necessary uh, to prescribe not only overt discrimination, but also practices that are fair and form the discriminatory operation. So when our only Supreme Court takes judicial notice in Fraser that adverse impact discrimination is much more prevalent than the cruder brand of openly discriminatory, uh, rather openly direct discrimination. And moreover, that it often poses a greater threat to the equality aspirations of disadvantaged groups. Are we inadvertently erasing the presence of the past? Are we inadvertently erasing the legacies of histories of racial subordination that continue to hold certain groups in certain forms of stereotypic employment. Or to ask this differently, might this history continue to inform why 37 years after adopting proactive legislation on employment equity federally, employment equity has not been achieved. 
So what's to be done in the face of reports of systemic discrimination so persistent and unyielding that, for example, the Ontario Public Service should move to a to all employees. Or the Canadian Human Rights Commission itself should be found to have discriminated against its own black and racialized employees. Where, asks equality law scholar Sonia Lawrence, are the Section 15 cases about race? Joshua Sealy Hamilton uh, perceptively underscores that ultimately the scope of equality law in Canada is contingent on whatever the court is willing to see. What I heard repeatedly in consultations with equality seeking and equality deserving groups is that they want their experiences of discrimination, all of the barriers that stand in the way of their equitable inclusion in Canada, all of the ways in which they remain overrepresented and look for which they are overqualified, to be deeply understood and addressed. Not aligned, understood. And they understood that labor markets may thrive, not necessarily despite the perceived inefficiency and irrationality of racial discrimination, but sometimes because of how racial inequality benefits some at the expense of others. What if race, what if blackness, is a persisting site of invisibilization? One that leads us to miss what an act of historical memory may show us the constitutive character of race and racialization in our labor law frameworks in Canada. It's crucial not to walk past this specificity. And to understand the specificity, we must equitably include and make space for the voice of those who've been historically marginalized for protection and rest. So in resting on this third option, employment equity, I'm reaffirming, reaffirming that it is by rendering historical specificity of equity claims visible and by making the structural choice in the face of systemic inequality to challenge the exclusion proactively that we can begin processes of labor market transformation that at its core is employment equity. It fosters comprehensive barrier removal. It turns attention to, or should turn attention to, representative structures for meaningful consultations that involve precisely those employment equity groups that have faced historical marginalization. And it secures dedicated resource regulatory oversight. Labor lawyers embark on the process of moving beyond all too easily decontextualized compromises that a transnational history of racial subordination has left us. In learning from our history, we accept the responsibility for and the power of transformation. So I'm just going to um, make a couple of remarks. Professor Blackett, uh, my hope is we willing to entertain questions uh, on her bracing remarks uh, for something like 20, 25 minutes. There will be a reception um, afterwards. Uh, there is a microphone. Um, I think it would be useful uh, if, if we could get the microphone to people. <coughs> Um, one of our students, you know, has, has agreed to, to carry it to people just so that everyone in the room can be heard. We were going to have some people on Zoom. I don't think we do have any people on Zoom, but um, 
if you do have questions, please raise your hand and I'll, I'll do, do you want to sit there? Do you want to sit here? Do you have, I'll sit here and I'll, I'll um, take questions. So, uh, um, let me try and uh, uh, take up your intervention and, and take it into uh, a moment of litigation. The, the challenge in so much of your work, which is repeated uh, in the work of, of other scholars who have paid attention and who have tried to recover the place of history um, in the continuation and perpetuation of various forms of structural inequality, um, racial stratification, and other forms of stratifications in the market is that it's critical to understand and appreciate the continuing rule of history, um, so big categories, um, in the present structure of racial stratification, who gets jobs and who doesn't. Um, in in uh, other fields and other um, um, claims for justice, let's put it this way, uh, in indigenous claims for justice, we, we have increasingly seen the particular ways in which history, historical oppression, um, state practices become relevant in litigation in understanding and attempting to reverse and push back against those forms of oppression. And so, when I, when we have these conversations, um, and when when I've heard you make these interventions, there's there is sometimes a tension in um, the particular set of what gets captured by the category of history. Which history are we pointing to? And in particular, what does it mean to try and bring that? history or history or an understanding of that history um, into the tribunal uh, in, before the tribunal adjudicator, um, before the judge, before the arbitrator. There is a big history uh, right, of, of racial discrimination, racial oppression, stratification. Um, we can point to other historically disadvantaged groups in which that historical, those historical forms of oppression matter. But can you can you say more um, about the, where the rubber hits the road, um, the ways in which that history or histories or what gets included in the category of history that might matter um, in the forms of claims that are made, uh, if it's litigation and if it's not litigation, that's 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 fine as well. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for that. It's uh, such an evocative uh, question, and it's certainly one uh, to which uh, I think uh, you're required to uh, pay uh, more attention. You rightly uh, evoked our grappling with indigenous truth and reconciliation <laughs> to the point where we now have uh, courts acknowledging settler colonialism and engaging with what that means for our starting frameworks right, and how we understand those. That is huge and would not have been possible if we uh, remained at the level of um, found in fictions. Um, uh, in my own work and in this presentation, um, I've wanted first to respond. To respond to a growing unease that I've felt about the way in which we've allowed uh, an effects-based approach uh, to uh, 
discrimination law uh, to, in some cases, abstract us away from historical <laughs> And I want to be really clear. This isn't saying we go back to intent. Right? That's not the argument. It's that we engage with the why. Um, I would suggest that we're even seeing this more in the incredibly challenging moment in the U.S. context on affirmative action, mm -hmm. where the attempt to hang the hat on diversity has, of course, now uh, been uh, deeply challenged. But what we're hearing more in some of the challenging is the need to actually deal with the history of slavery. What does it look like? Um, and so, you know, just as Katanji Brown Jackson's uh, inquiry about hmm, legacy admission, if your family was able to go to uh, an Ivy League school over several generations versus if your family uh, was enslaved. Uh, so the operationalization uh, becomes important in seeing why it's important not just to rush to a decontextualized understanding of those facts, but to engage with an understanding of effects that are historically rooted. You opened the opportunity to me very generously of also responding in terms of the law reform. And of course I see that as more capacious because one can actually think about the kinds of structures one might put in place if uh, historical legacies were taken seriously. There are a number of initiatives outside of labor that are underway, that certainly um, in the context of African Nova Scotians here, unfortunately. Uh, sometimes uh, the relationship with litigation and the dialectic relationship there is important as a comment uh, uh, claims titles of registration dimension of that. Uh, in uh, the labor context, obviously, I'm gesturing amongst others to impact equity as uh, significant in its ability to operationalize and try to operationalize substantive equality and to do so in a way um, that is reflexive to regulation uh, uh, outside as much as possible of uh, the litigation process. But uh, that sets a different set of uh, actions in play. Uh, so, uh, yes, so I see the role as uh, significant uh, and um, also, frankly, somewhat unbounded. I, I don't think we necessarily know or even need to know where taking our history seriously will lead. Should take them seriously because because their legacies are with us. We need to do those. Hi, Nell. It's Jenny Dudowski from Osprey Hall Law School. Thank you so much. I, I want to talk about how much I appreciated your effort to make sure that we see the continuity over and over again, right? There's history, but it's not just history. The history is with us. 
And that's often a very hard thing to get people to believe. And so I, I'm going to move this out of uh, litigation and into sad stories I hear from across Canada and observe uh, of what happens about racism in the academy. And very crudely put, I think what I see is that for decades, uh, systemic racism, racism was handled to exclusion. But then there came a point where they really couldn't get away with that anymore. But now, in some ways, it's more shocking what I see. That is, those people who have been hired are treated badly, seriously badly. But the institution can't see it. And partly because I think of similar kinds of reasons, they think the history is history. <coughs> so somebody who, a racialized person who had been at a university for 20 years and started in great detail, you know, exclusion, marginalization, oversight, any one of which, you know, you couldn't make a deal out of. But it was a, a very compelling story. And the university commissioned an independent report that didn't see any of it and didn't even mention systemic racism. It, it was as if uh, they just hadn't heard of any, any of this conversation. Um, and another example of uh, two, there were only two racialized uh, young colleagues who were coming up for tenure, and they forgot to forward those files to the university. So come June, they hadn't heard. And they called and found out, oh yeah, we forgot. And instead of, you know, an abject apology, they said, oh, well, you know, these things happen. So, you know, the, these are not isolated stories. I'm hearing more and more. So there's something, what, what you see in the law is, of course, not surprisingly, a replication of kind of collective consciousness, which cannot integrate what they think they know about history, but that's history can't wait to pass, with what's right before them. So how do we remedy that? <laughs> I didn't think that might be bleeding. So thank you uh, so much, uh, Professor Ndowski, for that uh, comment. And uh, what, I'll, what I'll say is this. What you have just expressed, I heard it over and over in the context of consultations. Uh, and the sense that we've spent such a long time, in particular with quite an industry of EDI, the training. Unconscious bias, the you know the practices that are supposed to make us able to see these things, or maybe not. Maybe <laughs> they're just the practices. Maybe we're just supposed to do the practices, and not much changes. Uh, the report I quoted. I think was present. Right? Some of the literature uh, on many of these practices that are dehistoricized, that don't name the problem. Uh, much of the literature suggests they're not actually having effects. And that we can't step past the context, which includes the historical context, and expect that we're going to get at the solutions. We can't just talk reconciliation and not engage with the truth. So it's part of the reason for spending the time to have the hard conversation 
that in the repetition tells us that we may not have learned as much as we thought we had learned about the past. And we need to keep asking ourselves whether what we're doing now is that much better. And I don't want to be glib about that. There's a lot that has been done. But there are patterns of justification that repeat themselves. And by seeing those in historical context, I think we force ourselves to look much more carefully at why we're uh, repeating that. So thank you for that. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I'm not sure I have a question, but I have something that uh, I want to say. I thank you very much for seeing us and the sleeping car porters. Um, we don't get seen very often at all, as you just described. Uh, my grandfather was a sleeping car porter for 25 years. Uh, my father was a sleeping car porter for a while as well. And um, as you know, other people may not, sleeping car porters those positions were the epitome of employment for black people, for black men. That was the top of the line because there weren't any other jobs available that came remotely close to them that did. And so that's a greater context that I think gets erased. You couldn't get other jobs here in Nova Scotia. And so what happened is they went off and they worked the trains they went away from their families. My grandmother was looking after the rest of the family while he was coming and going. The racism, the slavery on the rails that they experienced 24 hours a day. And then the trauma that that had um, you know, on him and in our family. Um, and so I feel him today. And my know, sisters, can I thank you for for saying that? Um, and I guess the second point I wanted to underscore was that everything, all roads on this go back to slavery. The reason we couldn't get jobs is because we're seen as less human. We're seen as less human to justify our enslavement to build the wealth of the Western world. And the reason why somebody can be ignored and their file not looked at or whatever is, if they're a person of African descent, if they're black, is it's just it's this ingrained thing that we're not fully human. The reason why the voices that are out there from the Canadian um, Black Labor Unions and other things that, that have been giving solutions for decades is because we're not taken seriously and power isn't shared with us, I guess, because we're not human, again, all leading back to slavery. And so there's no question in there. It's just a conclusion that I've come to from my lived experience and everything else that, that the law has shown us. And I just um, thank you for being another dimension of that to us today. Thank you very much, Professor Williams, for sharing that um, uh, really compelling uh, dimension. And um, uh, the parallel. Uh, made by Cecil Foster as well between uh, the history of the work of porters and the history of domestic workers. And it really was the, the public face of that historical legacy of slavery and servitude. Uh, and the so-called private dimension of that domestic working uh, is so crucial to see those continuities, and so crucial as well to see uh, the resistances of the people who faced the everyday indignities 
um, but still manage to build communities here in Halifax, in Montreal, it's the little Burgundy neighborhood near the train stations. That, uh, that was not. So, so the history is important, and uh, so much of what I've been trying to do with this work and past work is to say that, of course, it's labor history. It's labor law. Uh, uh, and uh, part of seeing the margins of our field and redefining it, it involves doing this close uh, work. Uh, and hopefully, this close work also then puts a spotlight on why we value collective voice so much in the labor law context. It is about maturity uh, that people are able to represent themselves uh, and in the process uh, give dignity to the work that they are doing in that process is transformative. It transforms a group place. They're going to be, I think maybe it makes sense, there are at least two questions here from, from Amy and, and from Faye. Um, and, and then maybe we'll, we'll close it there and continue the conversation over. I, um, I just wanted to, to point out what I see as, as a tension between um, sort of some current trends that I'm seeing, and I think you're very important, Paul, for a vocal consultation with historically marginalized groups. So in the Fraser decision, the Supreme Court talked about the need to use statistical analysis in order to make visible um, uh, um, people's, uh, 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 to make visible um, people's experiences of marginalization. And what I'm seeing um, right now is often a choice being made, even within EDI groups, on what data gets collected and what, then therefore, what questions get asked and then what information and forms of oppression become visible. And then I've, I've also seen lately um, a shift in, in speaking from, from speaking of historically marginalized groups and equity seeking groups to talking about equity deserving groups. So we don't have the data, for example, that women are disadvantaged, so therefore they don't deserve equity anymore, and then we don't need to consult them on um, equity initiatives. Um, and I think that really underscores the importance of looking at, well, of, of of, of, of considering disadvantage from a historical context. And I just, um, I was very interested when you said, were, spoke about how we're doing EDI and we might be doing it wrong. I attended an unconscious bias training once in uh, which a man was presenting and decided to ex describe his experiences of having unconscious bias by making a demeaning joke about how he doesn't listen when women speak. And I thought to myself, no other protected group would, would have been subject to that kind of um, that kind of anecdote, and yet because he couldn't see women's disadvantage, really, he just he wasn't able to even see it within the context of unconscious bias training. Wow, <laughs> that's quite the session. Um, thank you for that comment. And uh, yes, there's there's a tension. I think the Fraser does a lot of work. Uh, one in, in while validating the importance of the statistical data does make it the only or necessary requirement. And, and there is a latitude to look at the range of factors. And our court has recognized the importance of historic disadvantage, but it's historical disadvantage, but doesn't quite, uh, yeah, the, the, the uh, Section 15 analyses have not entail this kind of work, and I want to underscore I'm not asking for more work in the Section 15 analyses. Uh, but your question is to the choices that are being made about the type of statistical information that's being collected, and I uh, take that uh, very seriously. One of the things that I've noticed, uh, which I think is actually quite 
powerful in this moment is that stats can itself has been quite attentive to drawing in uh, expert representation from uh, historically marginalized communities in assessing and, in, frankly, in just framing uh, uh, the uh, community's uh, representation in work and housing and inter education and the like. Uh, I think that is part of this direction of engaging uh, more broadly with communities on the data that come forward with them. Uh, there's also a quite remarkable initiatives underway in the British Columbia context on the collection of race-based uh, statistical data. And uh, framing through what's referred to as the grandmother principle that really centers the purpose of data collection, so it acknowledges the historical harms that uh, could uh, have been faced, uh, in particular by indigenous communities, by racialized groups, uh, by the collection, and really ensuring that the approach is uh, very much in keeping with the proposal approach. So this is this is uh, not insignificant movement on uh, on this. Um, I think that the remaining challenge, though, is uh, when this gets operationalized at the workplace level, including the university workplace. Right? What are we looking at and how do we do? So again, is there a role for law reform in guiding how uh, this uh, information Right. Is there a way in which employment activity can be the basis for more rigor in what it is we say we're, we say we're understanding uh, in the world of, uh, of uh, equitable inclusion? Yeah, uh, there was this, I think there might have been a, a dimension right at the very end of your question that I, that I might have. Have I answered your question? Yeah. Okay. Hi Adele. Uh, it's really great to listen to how you've mapped that out so rigorously for us and um, pointing out the importance of being historically grounded is um, is really important to be able to have these th these experiences see. And as someone who in the litigation context, I swear every case they do, my evidence starts, well, 150 years ago. <laughs> and, and adjudicators look at it and think, this is not relevant to the case, right? My, my approach has always been that I need to give you this history so that you can see the moment, like what exists now, and then understand the impact. Um, but I think that we're still very far away from a place in which adjudicators can understand why they need to hear the history. Um, and so when you were saying that, you think there's um, enormous potential in the area of law reform. I'm, I'm curious about uh, where you see that going. Certainly um, the Federal Employment Equity Act was structured in a way that was you know, naively optimistic about if we could just, you know, show you the numbers, you would do the right thing. Um, and there was no um, uh, union capacity to enforce things, right? It was like, oh, if we just shine information, things will change. So, um, being attentive to our moment in history now, as you're doing this deep rethinking, um, we certainly don't live in that moment of optimism, of uh, people doing the right thing, and there's the very active um, backlash. The, you know, in, in which uh, demands for equality that 
are um, hearing are increasingly about the need for diversity of opinion, which is really code for um, uh, it, that uh, voices that disbelieve in substantive equality and disbelieve in human rights should get equal billing with what is actually our constitutional right to substantive equality. Um, so when you talk about optimism of law reform, and I don't mean to preempt your report, <laughs> where, do you, where do you hang that optimism mm -hmm. when both the, um, the political discourse is actively anti-equality and adjudicators are not yet at a point where they can understand the evidence that's before them. Um, and I know that as someone who does this work, you have to be irrationally optimistic <laughs> to make social change. But, so where do you gain the optimism? <laughs> that is such an excellent question. Uh, so first, um, because I know you know, uh, Professor Faraday um, has for many, many <laughs> years uh, been at the forefront of calling our courts to take seriously the promise of Section 15, including in respect of exclusion of historically marginalized workers, farm workers, uh, uh, in uh, collective bargaining law. Uh, so uh, I uh, hear uh, what you are saying. Uh, and uh, this rationally would be a moment, is a moment to be and it's not just here, although much is coming here. This is transnational. Mm -hmm. and it is a deeply discouraging moment uh, for social change. Uh, and there are huge risks. Uh, but it's also being in precisely those moments that historically marginalized groups, including workers, have insisted on change, have taken uh, courageous action for change, um, and rested those actions, yes, on strategic litigation sometimes, on taking to the streets in other times, on uh, using long form moments in other times. Uh, but uh, they have uh, insisted on the justice of their claims. In that sense, I don't actually think this moment is any different. The justice of the claims is crucial. Again, uh, the truth and reconciliation uh, work, the work that we've all had to do uh, on these lines of reckoning with uh, uh, unmarked graves, of, uh, the atrocities uh, of the past. I don't think that leaves us in the same place where we were and compels So uh, I like to refer to myself as cautiously <laughs> optimistic. <laughs> uh, uh, but also, and perhaps this is really for the end, collectively. Um, and in a spirit of cautious and collective optimism, I invite you to thank Professor. <laughs>